they already announced me, my name is Mariana Romanishin, I work as a computational linguist at Grammarly, and I want to thank you all for coming, because the competition today is like really tough, so I'm really glad that you guys came, and I hope that I won't disappoint you. So uh, we're talking today about text simplification, and uh, that's why my, the topic of this talk is linguistics in NLP, why so complex? First, I'm going to give you some motivation as to why uh, this topic is uh, important. Why do we even need to simplify text then? Then we will look at um, like the most uh, straightforward approach to solving this problem. Uh, we will talk specifically about identifying complex words and uh, simplifying complex words. Um, so let's start with some motivation. Can you hear me well? Yes. Good. Can you see the slides? Great. Okay, let's go. So, where do complex words come from? A very obvious answer. From, they come from complex text, <laughs> right? Okay, this doesn't work, sorry. Yeah, they come from complex text. Um, what texts are complex? So, say we are non-specialists and we, it's really tough for us to understand texts that are written in, uh, about some medical uh, topic or some legal documents or some like technical, I don't know, language. And uh, if, uh, if we read a text like that, it lowers our comprehension, so we don't understand it well. If we had a tool that could automatically simplify this text, and uh, we could then read it, right, and understand it better. Or say you're a second language learner, like most of people in the room. Or say you're a native speaker, but with low literacy level. Or say you have some disability or reading impair impairment, God forbid. Or even uh, if, you're, if you're of... Um, if, if you're a child, right, but you want to understand something, so that's how, like, for example, simple Wikipedia appeared, because people with lower reading comprehension would want to understand the same information that you and I do. Um, so, or you may be like a non-native speaker, like me or my friend Joey here, and uh, you need to write something really important, say you need to write a supportive letter to a baby adoption agency, and you want to say something that your friends are warm and nice people with big hearts, but you want to sound smart, right? So what you do, you go to a dictionary and you find like the most um, smart, the, the smartest words that you can find in the dictionary, and then your text becomes like this. They are humid, prepossessing homo sapiens with full-sized aortic pumps. <laughs> um, okay, guys, I have this AI Ukraine 2018 bot logo here. Can we remove it? Yeah. Okay, I hope they will. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that wasn't me. So, um, text simplification will actually make you sound smarter. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> okay, I'll go on and I hope that they will help us. Uh, so, uh, if you have a really rather simple context, but you choose like really complicated words, it may be the case that your text will sound stupid. Um, so the aim of text simplification as a huge area of NLP is to facilitate reading comprehension for non-specialists, for second language learners, for children, for people with some disabilities, and so on and so forth, or even for other NLP applications. Say if you're doing text summarization, right? It's much easier to summarize text that is simple. It's much complex to, more, more complicated to summarize text that is, uh, that is complex. So text simplification can help with that. Um, there are different ways of text simplification. There can be syntactic simplification, lexical simplification, explanation generation, and some more. Um, we're going to talk today about lexical simplification specifically. So what are these three ways of simplification? Syntactic simplification is when you take a really complex sentence, like London, which is the capital of the United Kingdom, is located in Southeast England, and you can break it into multiple sentences. You can say London is the capital of the United Kingdom, it is located in Southeast England, right? Okay. Um, Lexical simplification is uh, uh, simplifying really complex vocabulary, words and phrases to simpler ones, while preserving the meaning and grammaticality of the sentence. So this is something that we will look more closely into today. You can also do explanation generation. Say, if you have a text, the baby was born with pulmonary atresia. Uh, like, how many people in the room know what pulmonary atresia is? Like, none, right? Because we are non-specialists. But if you have a text simplification system that can generate, add an explanation, saying pulmonary atresia is a type of heart defect, you know, this text becomes like more understandable for you and I. Um, okay, this logo really, uh, really is not good. Yeah, it covers part of the presentation. <laughs> Could you try removing it, please? Thank you. <laughs> 
Yay! <laughs> okay. You won't find many demos on the web of text simplification because it is still an unsolved task. If we look at lexical simplification specifically, I mean like rephrasing complex words to more simple words, uh, you will find, for example, IBM Content Clarifier. And in the demo example here, you can see that the word humongous, for example, is replaced with the word large. The word food superannuated, which most of the people in the room won't know, is uh, replaced with the word old and so on. At Grammarly, we also uh, had to do a task like that, for specifically for the cases when a person is writing a rather simple context and want to appeal to a broader audience, like say you're a writer or a blogger or a journalist, and you're using a word that will not be familiar to people who will read, read your blog or your post or your article. So we, will, we would want to correct that to a simpler one. Um, all right, so let's, um, I hope that you understand why stack simplification is needed, and now we can see uh, what are the ways of solving it. Um, so, the first thing that any researcher would do is to find out like what is already out there, right? What we already know. Uh, there were two shared tasks in the in academia on complex word identification, like identifying this complex vocabulary, in 2016 and 2018. What they found is that complex word identification module helps when you want to do lexical simplification. Like if you have two steps, first we identify, then we simplify, well, you can get better results. Uh, another finding is that even uh, like this year's task, the shared task of 2018, and the report is already published, uh, we can see that traditional machine learning approach outperforms deep learning. This means that we have, uh, you and I here in the room, have a good opportunity to do some feature extraction, to, to look at some interesting linguistic features that can be used for our traditional machine learning approach to get even better. Uh, there's not much data. Um, some, there is some uh, non-annotated data. Some of you may know that Wikipedia comes in two versions. There's a regular Wikipedia and simple Wikipedia for people with lower comprehension levels. There's also some news uh, resources like New Seller here that has the same uh, piece of information, the same piece of news written for different levels of, uh, of knowledge, of, uh, yeah, of, of reading comprehension. Uh, unfortunately, the data from the shared task of 2016 and 2018 wasn't that good. If we look more closely at it, we can see that words like one or laughter were marked as complex, or in some cases, since they were annotating with crowdsourcing platform Amazon Mechanical Turk, some people didn't even bother and they just annotated every other word as complex, which doesn't make sense. But, you know, garbage in data, this is something that we have to do to deal in real life every day, so this is not news for you. Uh, this means that we will need like better data for that. And uh, what in, in our task, we had to re-annotate some of the corpora. Um, so what would we do? So we take the text, uh, probably we would want to do some text processing, like uh, make sure that this text is written in the language that we are working on, like English. Then we would want to tokenize the text, find parts of speech for each token. Then we would want to do some feature extraction. And uh, the intuition tells us that complex words are like long, words that are, uh, that are rare words, like a flower frequency. And we would use the part of speech that could be useful too. Um, uh, then we can do our complex word identification module, like maybe train the classifier, right? In, um, in uh, the shared task of 2018, the winning system was using uh, like simply logistic regression for, uh, for classification of word being complex or non-complex. And uh, we can find potentially complex words like that. Then we can take a thesaurus. Thesaurus is a dictionary of synonyms. So we have our complex words. We can extract synonyms for it. We rank these synonyms by frequency, and we have a profit. Simplify text and put them back, like the, the, the most frequent synonym put back. Um, how would we measure success? Well, uh, criteria of success by NLP researcher are pretty simple. So we get good of measure on our test set, right? So good precision and good recall. And we must have like an OK speed. And we say, like, good enough. But um, there's like, I, I believe many people in the audience can relate to that. So, but there is one tiny problem. You and I guys are not the final consumer of the NLP product that we are developing, right? So it's better that we actually ask the users of the NLP, uh, of the NLP system what they actually want. And when you ask a user, a user wants the system to simplify the words consistently, to, uh, for the simplified text to be grammatically correct, so the text to be indeed simpler and not just you know, having a synonym replaced there. Not too simple though, because that can influence the meaning and the meaning well shouldn't change, right? So the regular user will tell you like, no, not good enough. Um, let's look closer now at uh, like our complex word identification module and complex word simplification module and see how we can reach you know, these requirements that the user gives us. 
Uh, so the first feature that we were talking about is like word frequency. So these complex words that appear in text, they are usually like low frequent words. We don't use them every day and that's why not many people know them. You know. Uh, so how do we calculate word frequency? The simpler approach would be just get a log corpus, tokenize it, and just count how many times you see each word, right? So it sounds pretty simple. But you will immediately see a problem. Your program, your, your model, is uh, classifying the words inconsistently. Because it will classify the word accessorize as simple, but the word accessorize as a complex word. Why? It's just because when you were calculating that, you were calculating word forms. Word form frequencies, not word frequencies. Um, and the word accessorize and accessorizes are actually two word forms of one, of one word. If you ask a linguist, that would, a linguist would call it a lexeme. So when you want to calculate the frequency of the word, you would want to take into account all of the forms of this word that are, uh, that are possible in the language. So in Ukrainian language, that would be a horrible task to do because in Ukrainian language, you can have like 30 different forms of the verb and 14 forms of the noun. And uh, for the English language, being, every language like have their own specificity. So in the English language, for example, this particular word would be spelled a little bit differently for British English. And the internet and your corpora will be so much biased towards American English. This means that your program will start marking the word accessorize writing, written with an S as a complex word and written with a Z as a simple word. So you would want to include like this alternative spelling too. So how do we know what forms uh, each, wo uh, each word in the language can have? Uh, there's this uh, um, uh, section of uh, linguistics that is called inflectional morphology. This is the study that tells you how the word forms are formed in the, in the language that you are working with. So uh, in this case, we can, we can see that there are, in the English language, there are like, different degrees of comparison for adjectives, different forms of verbs, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can actually use a dictionary like a dictionary. There are many resources like that that actually described all of this information for you a long time ago. Um, and you can just use this as a linguistic resource to get better, uh, f uh, to calculate the frequencies of your words better. And this also um, gives us information about lemmatization. So lemmatization is the um, is a process of uh, transforming a word form to a lemma. Uh, because like when you have a, a couple of word forms of one lexeme, one of them is always chosen as to be a lemma, like the base form. So yeah, uh, we can do lemmatization, meaning uh, changing any word form to its uh, base form. And we will need that because when we go to the thesaurus, our dictionary of synonyms, to go look for synonyms, uh, you would need to, to have the lemma of your word, right? Because uh, the dictionary doesn't, the thesaurus won't have entries for every word form that you need. Okay, moving on. Our second feature was word length. And it should be a pretty simple feature for you when you're like just, just count the number of characters, right? Like what can be difficult about that? But you will see that your model is again working inconsistently because it would mark the word friend as simple and friendliness as complex. But you can agree that any word that any person that already learned the word friend would understand the word friendliness, although it's longer and, and less frequent. And why is that? It turns out that some long words are actually simple. And they are actually simple because they, uh, their formation came through a very you know, transparent and well-explained process. So this transparent and very explained process, like you, if you know the word like mouth and watering, you would know the word mouth watering. Or if you know the word treat, you would know the word mistreatment. So this, uh, this well-explained process is called derivational morphology that explains how words um, uh, are a change, uh, like how words grow different, uh, different morphemes on the left and on the right and form like new words. So if you can explain this process, if you can develop a tool that is called like morphological analyzer that will tell you which word your particular word came from, uh, you would be in a better position because now you can analyze the word nation, not the word denationalization. And now for the word nation, you can calculate frequencies. And now for the word nation, you can calculate its uh, word length, okay? All right, moving on. Um, if we're uh, going a uh, level lower from morphemes, because we were talking about the orbit, then we split the word into some pieces. These pieces are called morphemes. And now we're talking about letters. So we can, we can also extract some word features. If you look closely at our complex words, we can see that the, the sequences of characters, and these sequences are called engrams, character engrams, are quite unusual. Like if you take a complex word abhorrence and, uh, and uh, you know, model sequences of five or of four, you can see that you, know, you cannot think of other words that, can, uh, that actually contain these particular character combinations. 
But if you take, um, and you can see like this, this carrot sign and a dollar sign at the end, these, are, these mark boundaries of the word. It's also useful information. But if you take a simpler counterpart of the word abhorrence, that would be anger, abhorrence means anger, you can, uh, and you look at four grams of the word anger, you can think of many words that are like anger, like hunger or rage or danger and so on. So all of them contain, uh, all of them are quite popular and they contain these character combinations. So character anger is a very good feature for identifying complex words. Uh, moving on, we can actually move a level lower. Now you can think like, what's, what's more granular than letters, right? So we are now, we were at the word level, then morpheme level, then letter level, what's more granular than letters? Let's look at phonetics, how the words are pronounced. So here you can see in red two complex words that are uh, long, right? And below you can see two simple words that are also long. Um, there is a hypothesis that complex words have higher consonant vowel ratio. So if we look at the transcription of these words, procrastinate and flabbergasted and neighborhood and information, we can see that in simple words, we have like one to one ratio of consonants and vowels. In complex words, the, uh, the number of consonants is usually higher. So this will be a very interesting feature and very useful feature in your complex word identification program. Um, and you, could actually, you should actually calculate that on the lemma of the word, right? Because if the word is inflected, so say uh, procrastination or uh, like neighborhoods, then you're just adding like another consonant there. <laughs> so you should lemmatize the words before that. Um, and uh, we can extract like many more phonetic features like number of vowels or consonants, the ratio of consonants and vowels, number of repeating sounds would be interesting too, number of syllables and so on. Uh, what if we go a level higher and talk about semantics? So how many meanings of the word mouse do you know? At least two, right? <laughs> Well, at least two. Uh, you can see like a mouse and another mouse on the screen. Well, actually, there are four meanings of the word mouse as a noun and also another one meaning of the, of the word mouse as a verb. And if you're curious about that, you should look it up. So um, uh, the hypothesis is that the simpler words, more simple words, they usually evolve in the language. We use them all the time and we try to use them in different meanings. Uh, and this means that these words, you know, they gain more and more meanings while they're in the course of their evolution. But complex words are not used every day and they do not acquire new meanings as readily as, as simple words. So uh, such uh, simple words as report, a mouse, or, uh, or mouse would have, you know, many, many meanings. Like report would have seven meanings as a noun and six as a verb. And uh, such complex words as elucidate or moribund or abhorrence that we uh, looked at just a slide ago, uh, they would have like one or two meanings. So the number of meanings, like a very simple feature, but could be very important in identifying complex words. And you can use any dictionary, like any dictionary in any language to, to do that. So in this case, I looked in WordNet. WordNet isn't specifically a dictionary. This is a uh, semantic network, an ontology. And uh, we can actually extract even more information from WordNet in addition to the number of senses. Um, so if we look closely at WordNet, the words there, uh, specifically not the words, but the senses of different words, they appear there in different lexical semantic relations. So if we look at, the, uh, at mouse in the meaning of uh, an animal, we can see that the mouse has like, many types, like house mouse, field mouse, wood mouse, and so on. It has some sister terms, like has to hamster or rat, and it also has a hyper name, like a term that generalizes all of the, uh, like the hamster, rat, and mouse, that is called rodent. If you look at the mouse's electronic device, it will have some different relations. Like one different relation would be meronym, so part of the mouse would be a mouse button, for example. So if you can find the word in the text, in, uh, like the word uh, that, you, uh, that you suspect could be complex, and you look at the, uh, at the position of this word in the WordNet hierarchy, you can explain like, how exactly complicated this concept is. Like if it has many, many, many levels below it, you know, this can explain the parts of this word or the types of this word, it means that this word is more and more complicated, right? So we can extract many semantic features to help with our complex word identification, like the number of senses, number of hypernames and hyponames, like how many levels are above and below the word, number of holonyms and meronyms, meaning how many parts this word has, and is this word a part of something? Uh, yeah, that wasn't me. <laughs> okay, we can even go a level higher, like what's higher than semantics? So there's the whole field of linguistics that is called psycholinguistics. And um, uh, psycholinguistic studies, they comprehend the acquisition and the production of language and the comprehension of language. And um, 
uh, there are uh, psycholinguistic databases that can be useful. Like uh, I linked one of the psycholinguistic databases here, and the slides will be available after the uh, after the talk. So you can, for example, see how concrete the term is. Like chair will be more concrete than love, for example. Or uh, such a, an interesting criterion as imageability. So if I say accident, you can. Uh, this, uh, this word can revive some images in your brain, right? If I say the word advantage, that doesn't revive the images so, uh, so readily. So imageability of the word may influence, on, uh, may influence the uh, level of complexity of the word. Familiarity, like how many people actually in the audience are familiar with this word. Age of acquisition, like how old were you when you started using this word? Or how old were you when you started understanding this word? And so on. So all of this information can be found in the psycholinguistic database. And all of this information can be used as features for a uh, complex word identification module. Okay, so now we've identified our complex words. How do we simplify them? So um, the, the simplest thing that we can do, we just lemmatize the word, right? We, because we need a space. We take the part of speech of the word that we identified with our part of speech tagger. This is one of the NLP processing tools. Uh, why we need that? Because the synonyms for the word mouse as a verb would be so, many, so much different than synonyms of the mouse as a noun. And you can also argue that you know mouse has like four different. Uh, well, mouse is a simple word, but as an example, so some comp some words can have multiple meanings. So we should choose synonyms for this specific meaning. And we're not going to dive into that. That is called word sense disambiguation. And I talked about this like a year ago. So if you're interested in that topic, uh, talk to me. I will let you know more about it. Then we would extract synonyms from this thesaurus, put the synonyms in the place of the original word, and we would need to rank them just right. So let's see how to do this. Uh, ah, yeah. So this is the type of a thesaurus. This thesaurus is called like thesaurus com. Anybody can access it. Um, if we input this complex word dipsomania, it gives you like multiple synonyms, and there are also like additional tabs. And in each of the tabs, there's like a different meaning with more and more synonyms. So let's just take a sentence uh, where we saw the word dipsomania and we identified it as a complex word and put simpler synonyms in the in place. But wait, like not all of the synonyms you know, work here, because if you look at the first synonym habit, it's like too general. We don't want to suggest it. And maybe when we do the ranking, you know, uh, just by frequency, this habit synonym will win. So we, but it will be too simple. It will change the meaning. And then uh, if we look like lower, there's the word inebriacy, which is <laughs> like as complex as dipsomania. If you change dipsomania to inebriacy, the user won't be thankful because they still don't understand what you're talking about, right? Okay, so like alcoholism or alcohol abuse would be a much more uh, acceptable simplification of the word dipsomania. So uh, we should ask ourselves the question: like, is the word that we are uh, is that we are using as a synonym simpler? And how do we define that? Well, we already built a complex word identification module, so we can actually uh, use our our model, uh, our class classifier, to see whether uh, this current word is simple or not. Uh, like the synonym is simple or not. How do we define if the word is not just simple? Well, we should just look at the gap. Like, uh, is this word like much, much, much more frequent than uh, than the, our original word? If it is, maybe you know it's uh, it's too simple. Or we could also check polysemy. So the word habit, for example, has many, many, many meanings, and it can mean like. Uh, some, some good habits, some bad habits, some drug habits, some uh, alcohol habits, and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe it's like too polysemous uh, to, uh, to put in, this, in the current context. Then we should also see like, whether the simplified sentence is grammatically correct. And that is also something that uh, your users will, will appreciate. So uh, if you found the word, for, the word verb, for example, in some inflected form, then please you know, change the synonym to inflected form too, like change in fronts to insults, not to insult. Um, if you have uh, a noun in plural, please change the, the synonyms in plural, into to plural too. If you have an article, for example, before it, like a destitute area, don't say a impoverished area to an impoverished area. Or if you have degrees of comparison, you know, you should go, your words should go through transformations and you would change more destitute to poor, not to more poor, which would not be grammatically correct. If you have uh, verb governing, for example, uh, you should, and you have the complex word colluded, uh, colluded can, uh, can be used with with him and colluded can be used with in it. She knew about the plan and colluded with him in it, for example. 
So if you change the word colluded to conspired, conspired can also be used with with, but it cannot be used with in. So the grammaticality, like the verb governing, for example, in this case, so this phenomenon is called verb governing, verb governs the preposition, uh, is an important thing to include. So how do we do that? In order to rewrite the suggestions, we would need to use a language model. And the language model will help us uh, verify that it's grammatically correct by the score that the language model uh, produces. And it will also help us find like the most probable word in the current context. So let's take a shorter sentence for an example. The patient was moribund. Moribund is a complex word that means dying. But uh, it can also mean fading, declining. Declining is not a very good synonym in this context, so we don't want it to win, for example, right? Um, so we have an original sentence, we have a list of replacements, and we have to find like, which replacement is the most fitting. Um, there are two types of uh, language modeling, statistical and neural language modeling. Let's go uh, look quickly at both. Uh, the statistical language model would, uh, would work like this. So we need to find the probability of this sentence. The patient was fading. Um, it will, the, the probability of the sentence, and you just know to the beginning and the end sign, uh, signs, these S's, these mark the boundaries of the sentence. So it's the probability of the word the, the beginning of the sentence, uh, multiplied by the probability of patient after the, the beginning of the sentence, multiplied by, sorry, multiplied by uh, was after the patient, and so on and so forth, right? But these chains, they can got, get really long. So what we would want to do is to use Markov assumption, which says that the future is independent of the past given the present. And in this case, like, we can simplify this formula to this formula. So we just say that each next word depends on n previous words. And this n is, can be like one, two, three, four, depending on the, on the complexity that you can afford. Um, how do we uh, calculate like, the probability of each of these? So to, uh, to estimate the probability of patient after the, we have to take like, all occurrences of the patient in our large corpus and uh, divide that by the number of occurrences of that. So that looks pretty simple. But what, what if, um, yeah, but of, what if we have never, yeah, one slide is missing, sorry. But what if we have never seen the word fading, for example? Then uh, we would, our probability would be zero, and since we have the product here, right? then the product of the whole, the probability of the whole sentence will be zero too. So in order for that uh, not to happen, there are many smoothing te techniques, which I will not dive into right now because it needs like another half an hour to explain. Um, like the simplest thing that you can do is to uh, just pretend that you saw everything that came with the zero that you saw at least one time, and then you know, steal some, uh, some scores from the things, from the uh, sequences that you saw more than once. Um, yeah, and there are more complicated, more intricate techniques too that are much more efficient. Um, there are some challenges for language mo statistical language models. First of all, they do not generalize much, and you need to have you need to have a really good corpus for them to generalize. A really large corpus that represents British, American, English, and so on and so forth. So, for example, if you've never seen a purple car in your corpus, the probability of purple car will be zero. Although this is like a very probable thing. Uh, so the statistical language model will not know that purple is a color and will not generalize to that. It doesn't capture long-range dependencies, like the patient that they met yesterday was moribund, and maybe the patient was moribund occurs frequently, but if you have this uh, relative clause in the middle, then you would, uh, again, find yourself with really low probability. Um, you, it's really difficult to scale to larger n-grams, because usually we use like the window of 5 maximum for, for, for this uh, for calculating these probabilities, right? And uh, yeah, and with these intricate smoothing techniques that I already found. Uh, one thing that can be uh, improved here are these, for example, long-range dependencies. If you use a tool that is called the syntactic parser, so here you can see a dependency parse tree on the, uh, on the screen. And this dependency parse tree represents the relations between words. Uh, and you can see the relation from the word was to the word moribund, and also from the word was to the word patient. And this means that this is like a biogram. So this is two-step sequence on the dependency tree, but in the, in the, on the token level, it would be like a 10 words or seven words sequence, something like that. So you can use that information in order to calculate the grammaticality of the sentence and enhance your language model. Uh, there are also neural language models uh, that are state of the art right now. Uh, so uh, an example of a neural language model would be like a recurrent neural network that uh, 
uh, maximizes the probability of the next word. So like uh, in the, here we have the word what, so these are word embeddings that come to a hidden layer, and the output would be the probability distribution of each of the word, right, in, the, in your vocabulary. And you, when you train the model, you need to maximize the probability that the word is would be the output. Would, uh, would have the highest probability in the output. So uh, when you want to estimate the probability of a sentence using a neural network language model, you would uh, input like words one by one and then uh, see the probability of your next word in the probability distribution that comes at the output layer and uh, then, you know, multiply these probabilities, for example. Um, there are also like problems with neural language modeling. Um, uh, they take a lot of time to train and they are much more expensive. This is something that you already know. Uh, sometimes they may generalize too, generalize too, too, too much, uh, but there are, there is the, there are <laughs> sorry, solutions to that too. So by that I mean that um, the output, like the byproduct of a neural language model would be word embeddings. And uh, with word embeddings we know that brown, white, and green, for example, would be like really close in the vector space representation. And uh, this means that green horse will have a much higher probability than it has in real life, for example. Um, one though, you know, caveat is that uh, although neural language models are uh, state of the art currently, they do not have shown too much improvement over statistical language models, and statistical language models are easier to fix uh, if you need like to retrain them really fast or something. So um, yeah, it depends on, on your needs, of course, which to use. Um, and uh, yeah, after using all of these techniques, we can find the best simplified word for, for our lexical, that, that, uh, that our lexical simplification system will do. Um, and the final pipeline looks a little bit uh, more complicated than the one that we started with. So we have a tax that goes through many levels of NLP pipeline of text processing. We do feature extraction and we now know that we have like many more features. Uh, we also have a repository where we collected all word frequencies, character engrams, maybe we have a word net, psycholinguistic database, a dictionary of subscriptions. All of this goes into feature extraction. Uh, and we have our complex word identification module. Then we identify potentially complex words. We find their synonyms in the sitars. We do candidate replacement. Then we filter ungrammatical to simple solutions. We rank them with a language model and we get a simplified tax. You can actually like either show like the first most probable simplified word or a number of, um, uh, of simple words depending on the product that you're building. Uh, and the conclusion. So. Number one, linguistic knowledge gives you power. <laughs> Number two, researchers are not the final consumers of applications, and you have to know about that and think about that in your job. Uh, number three, diving into the problem gives better results than not diving into the problems. And I would like to finish with a slide that I stole from Minyan Kant. There's a reference in the, in the bottom. Um, he spoke at Kohli in 2018, a professor in the uh, University of Singapore. So represents the current mindset, right? <laughs> When your machine learning doesn't outperform, what do you do? Like first you sigh, right? <laughs> That's what everybody does. <laughs> then you gather more data, maybe your model needs more data to, uh, to find proper weight. Then you simplify your model, like maybe it's easier just to do more hyperparameter searching. Then you read your archive, because maybe like new, <laughs> new architectures of neural networks appeared and you can try those. And like number five is you actually study your problem more. <laughs> So uh, I would encourage you to do number five first. <laughs> Thank you. Mariana, thank you for a very interesting speech. Thanks a lot. Uh, Fox, if you have any questions, just to raise your hand. OK. Catch? Yeah, I also added like two slides of references about all the stuff that I was talking about, <laughs> in case any of you guys need that. Could you speak closer? Uh, thank you for your presentation, and I see that your system is really useful. I have some questions, and as I understood correctly, you, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If we want to simplify difficult work, we have to add to cover difficult work and simple work. Yeah? Both, both of them need to be in our vocabulary. Yes, both yes. of them need to be in our vocabulary. Yeah. And what about new unseen difficult words? Where you get uh, this data sets yeah. for training or, and how you retrain your models and how to solve this problem? 
That is a very good question. Thank you very much. This actually, a lot of MLP applications suffer from the fact that you have a limited vocabulary, and when new words arise in the language, they appear, uh, especially in the medical domain, they appear all the time. Uh, there's no you know, good way to add them there. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer to your question. The answer would be try to get as broad vocabulary as you can, and maybe you know, revise it once a year, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Amazing. And uh, the question is, there's several levels. There's technical difficulties is the item now. The first presentation. Go. Thank you very much for the talk. It was amazing as usual. Uh, the question is, there are several different levels of application. And for example, you can simplify medical text for me, so I could read it, or you can simplify medical text so first-year student can read it, and it's a different levels of simplification. So how you kind of define this and how you can check the, the performance of the model at different levels, and is there a thing like that, or just, that we just simplify to the simplest kind of level, always? Uh, that is an awesome question, thank you. So, um, currently in the field, in the shared task, it was only binary, simple, binary problem, like either the word is complex or not. Uh, there was one paper that already uh, tried to have like three levels of complexity because it's always you know kind of subjective. So as soon as you get you know your annotators, your linguists, or your you know native speakers and ask them to mark where the word is uh, complex, not so complex, and simple, you know the the bias level is uh, becomes much and much higher. So at Grammarly, uh, we currently in our UI there is the um, uh, setting uh, window where you can set the audience, and we have three levels of audience. So we were able to adapt to three levels. Uh, there are of course many more levels of comprehensions of readers, but the task isn't the, so this this particular task hasn't been developed yet to acquire to adapt to all of them. Thank you for the presentation. Have you tried to understand the context of conversation of, of the text that you analyzed? Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't find that helpful for this particular task. So one thing that we took into account is if the text is already like overly complex, like if there is a complex word, uh, like a, a list of complex words in every sentence, it doesn't make sense to simplify it. It just means that the user doesn't want it. You know? But we, we didn't look at the, uh, we didn't try including like the whole text as a context. It's usually much more complicated and we decided that it's not worth for, for this task. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. I thank you for your presentation and I just want to ask about topic modulation. Mm -hmm. And is it effects to this task? Have you tried? Mm -hmm. So in, in our product we don't do, uh, we, we, Grammarly works like for everyone, as most of you know, for any text that you write everywhere. And uh, uh, topic modeling is not something that we do, unfortunately. But if you look at, uh, at the papers in complex word identification, there are, uh, there are data sets like, for specific topics. So of course, if, you, if you're writing your, complex, uh, or your lexical simplification module for a specific domain, it will look better than for a general domain. So it always is the case, yeah. Thank you. There's another question here. Hi, thank you for a wonderful presentation. One question. Uh, as far as I understand, the system only accepts or works with single words. Uh, what should one do with the combinations of words, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the word embedding? Excellent so, question. The words yeah. in their own are more or less simple, but the combinations. Yeah, so I was using examples only for single words, just for simplicity, but actually you can do the same thing for word phrases. Uh, one good resource to do that, like because uh, thesauri are very frequently word-oriented, but one very good resource for that would be PPDB. This is a paraphrase database. Uh, which conclude, includes not only word phrases, but also like structures. Like say this is a specific word, but then you can have like any noun, but then you can have a preposition, you can paraphrase that to something simpler. So yes, there are resources for that, and uh, it's like a valid, uh, a valid thing, so you, people do that too. But I was using single words for, simplic for simplicity. Yeah, thank you. And the last question. Today, like is this ball? 
think uh, how would you define whether you need to put a synonym or whether you need to add a description? Oh, we're not adding description. So this talk was about lexical simplification. Yeah, so well, what if you can just find the synonym? What if it's the only one word that has this meaning and you just need to add a description? Oh, yeah, then we would just highlight it, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but that's a very good question. So just uh, explanation generation is the third way of text simplification. is the most complicated one because you never know. Well, you need a very good database of explanations and uh, you have to deal with uh, words having multiple meanings and so on. So this is yet unsolved task. You can actually do it. <laughs> so right, thank you. Uh, there's one more. Can you take one more? Okay. 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 The last one. Two thousand, two thousand <laughs> greeners, Marianne. Uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, for your presentation. It was really interesting. And uh, my question, maybe you already told about, but uh, my question is. Uh, if you have word with uh, multiple meanings, you consider it as a complex word, yeah? Uh, my question is, what about words which has just one meaning and it's uh, very rare? Would you consider it as a complex or not? Because if you have many meanings, a person could uh, see this word and just uh, make a connection. Uh, if you have, uh, if word has only one meaning and no one uh, heard about it, uh, it would be completely taken off the context. Mm -hmm. Do you consider such words with only one meaning as a complex word? Mm -hmm. So that depends on what your users want. Like if your users want uh, wants to know which words will be not familiar for their audience. So say you're a blogger and you use a word that will not be familiar for your audience, most probably, and you want to know about that, then your product should probably like at least highlight it or generate definition or like show a definition of hover or do something. So it depends on what you need. If you want to your product to only generate you know suggestions in all cases, then you just exclude this vocabulary. So I'd say it depends on the needs of, of the product that you're developing. We're Great. thinking about users. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, Strong of applause for Mariana.